This is the Impact of Our Words, Session 3, and we'll be speaking specifically about the impact of our words to our husbands. In the beginning, God created all things, including man. He had many things which would provide him companionship, including dogs, but God knew that none of them would be the helper suitable for man, the easer connect go. That term easer means helper, but not just any helper, a strong helper. The English language doesn't seem to have a word that perfectly describes this Hebrew word, but we see that it's used 21 times in the Old Testament. God is described as the helper, the one who does for us what we cannot do for ourselves, so it implies indispensable companion. The konegdo image is according to the opposite of him, or as a mirror, a reflected image, complementary. Now, if your house is anything like mine, you have a dog or two. We've had dogs for over 30 years, and there's an interesting phenomena that occurs. Every dog we have ever had worships Andy. The sun rises and sets on him. The dogs like me, but I am not their number one beloved. Likewise, Andy adores them. It's quite a sight to see. Dogs today are often used as helpers, aiding someone by opening doors, retrieving items that have fallen on the floor, assisting a blind person in crossing the street, curbing anxiety, and even alerting to a drop in blood sugar. Yet, this was not all that God had in mind when he fashioned woman. Otherwise, he would have just used a dog. Genesis doesn't speak so much to man's and woman's differences, but to the depth of their one flesh union. Their differences are meant to show in their unified activity within the world. It's not the difference from each other, rather the differences for each other. God acknowledged that it was not good for man to be alone, so he fashioned this woman to complete what man lacked. And the opposite is implied. This relationship is supposed to mirror the relationship of God to the church. And when I think about that, I'm particularly convicted about the need to speak carefully with my spouse. This is an area of great risk in violating the concept of allowing our words of our mouth to be pleasing to the Lord. As little girls and then teenagers, we dream of our wedding and the man with whom we will love all the days of our life. It starts out so well, and then our nature begins to do a number on that blissful relationship. Thankfully, the Bible has many examples of women who have blessed the men in their lives and those who have not served them quite so well. We can do our husband a disservice. You don't have to look much further than Samson to see a man who chose poorly when it came to a life mate. His first wife, a Philistine woman, was certainly not his parents' choice of a wife for the man who was to be a Nazarite to God from the womb and begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines, Judges 13, 5. At the wedding, Samson shared a riddle. The payoff would be great if they could not solve it, but it'd be a huge loss for Samson if someone did guess the answer. On the fourth day of the feast, the 30 companions demanded that Samson's wife entice him to tell her the answer to the riddle. So she wept and whined and manipulated and pressed him hard every day until he finally told her. She, of course, went to the 30 companions and gave them the answer. Um, suffice it to say, it didn't turn out well. Samson's bride was later given to the best man. Well, next, he fell in love with Delilah. In verse 2 of this man's life song, again, the Philistines encouraged her to seduce him 
and see where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him. He resisted her charms and cajoling, giving her false answers three times, but she kept at him day after day until his soul was vexed to death. And he told her the truth. I'm sure you know how the story ended. He was shaved, bound, blinded, and mocked. Of course, God had purpose in all of this and the final say in his life. But what I wanted us to look at was how this man's life was impacted by the manipulation in the words of these women. Now, here are some examples of ways that women from the Bible have misled, misrepresented, discouraged, and caused trouble for the men in their lives. Eve encouraged Adam to eat from the tree of the fruit from the tree, believing the serpent over God. You know how that turned out. Sarai convinced Abram to sleep with her servant rather than trusting God's promise, resulting in the birth of Ishmael and in that creating the conflict between the Arab and Jewish nations that exist still today, Genesis 16. In Genesis 27, Rebekah disrespected her husband and thought her, taught her son to lie and deceive rather than trusting God's timing. In Numbers 12, Miriam spoke ill of Moses and was exiled from the community for seven days because God struck her with leprosy. And consequently, the entire community was held up for those seven days. Herodias instructed her daughter Salome to request of her stepfather, King Herod Antipas, the head of John the Baptist, essentially teaching her to conspire in murder and forcing the hand of her husband in committing murder, Mark 6. Now, we can be the encourager. Deborah, in Judges 4, 6 through 7, used diplomacy in reminding Barak, who was hesitant to obey the Lord, that God promised to go before them and would bless his obedience. Manoah's wife showed faith and provided insight to her husband when he feared that they would die because they had seen God. If the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering or shown us all these things or given us these announcements. Judges 13, 22 through 23. Ruth gently exhorted Boaz when she reminded him that he was a kinsman redeemer. Ruth 3, 9. Abigail showed discernment and wisdom when she managed to turn David's anger away from committing murder. David's response, may your discernment be blessed Today you have kept me from participating in bloodshed and avenging myself by my own hand. 1 Samuel 25, 30 through 33. The wise woman of Tekoa used her words to stop Joab from destroying an entire city because of the actions of Sheba. With her promise and following actions, the situation was resolved and there was no unnecessary life that was lost. 2 Samuel 20, 16 through 21. And of course, Esther exhibited courage, faith, and self-control as she risked her life going before the king, ultimately saving her people. Assemble the Jews and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my female servants will also fast in the same way. After that, I will go to the king, even if it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. Esther 4, 15 through 16. As a helper, we're called to help him be all that God intended, using diplomacy, insight, exhortation, discretion, wisdom, courage, and self-control. Now, most of us went through premarital counseling before getting married, and one of the topics that is covered is communication. 
Generally, they talk about verbal strategies to utilize and ways to say what you desire in a non-attacking fashion. They also teach the importance of listening. This is good information and useful, but it doesn't always get really to the heart of the matter, which is our self-centered behavior versus our other-centered behavior. Many years ago at Christ Community, we had some classes which were based on the teachings of Dr. Larry Crabb. And this was an important point that he would focus on. Until our focus is first and foremost on pleasing God, we won't be able to have communication that builds and helps our life mate. Now, going back to the example of Esther, there are many ways that she could have responded to this news about the decree which would kill the Jews. It would have been far easier for her to stay silent and risk nothing of herself but she stepped outside of her self-protective nature and committed to move into an other-centered nature. This first thing she did was pray and fast, not run in and talk. The next thing she did was prepare herself physically and emotionally and wait outside the courtyard to be invited in. She then spoke respectfully to her husband. After that, she provided a banquet, and then provided a banquet the next day as well. We don't know for certain why Esther chose to not make her request known at that first banquet, other than to presume that God put it on her heart to wait. And when we look at what ensued in the following 24 hours, it's highly likely that that's what happened. The following day, she again spoke respectfully. Notice the timing of her requests after the meal was prepared and after they had already eaten. There are many lessons to be learned here and when wanting to communicate an offense committed or speak on a heartfelt topic. In our world today, we feel the freedom to just speak what's on our mind. It is our right after all. But the book of Esther reminds us to, first of all, pray. Don't jump in and verbally unleash your thoughts. Number two, prepare yourself, putting your best foot forward. Number three, speak respectfully. I would really like to talk about what happened. Perhaps we could discuss it after dinner. Also, speaking respectfully includes not having personal verbal attacks. Number four, respect his needs too. You want to discuss whatever's on your mind, but don't lunge into the discussion right after he walks in the door from work or when the desire for food strongly exists. We all know that hangry people don't always respond reasonably. Five, listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. When it comes to timing, don't just bluster ahead if God is speaking to your heart to wait a moment or two. An area that can be forgotten is the arena of compliments and words of admiration. Of course, when we're dating, we're a fountain of words of admiration. You're so strong. You handled that so well. I missed you so much today. Those words flow easily from our mouths early on, but then we get caught up in the responsibility of life and the normalcy of living with this person, and we take for granted all those things that we admired. We can even become disdainful about some of the things we found attractive. We must not lose sight of the things that are good in our spouses, and we need to remember to be forthcoming in our praise. Proverbs 3.27 reminds us, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. I think Carol Mayhall said it well when she said, One of the greatest ministries a wife can have in her husband's life is the ministry of encouragement through admiration. Not flattery, but sincere praise. Now some things to avoid saying to your husband. You should have thought of that before. 
What do you want now? How many times do I have to tell you? That was dumb. You just don't think. You never listen to me. You're always in a mood. The never and always statements can be problematic. I myself was guilty of an always statement earlier this week when I told Andy, you always decide to feed the dogs at the moment that I announce dinner is on the table. Now some things your husband would be delighted to hear. I was thinking about you today. Thank you for caring for me. I love to watch you interact with the kids. I will always love you. Now that's a good place to put an always in. You handled that so well. They are lucky to have such a caring boss. Thank you. I'm praying for you. A modern day example of a woman who used her words to truly build up her husband is Ruth Graham, the wife of Billy Graham. While Billy Graham is well known and celebrated for his impact for the gospel, he's the first to say that his wife deserves the praise. At her funeral, Billy Graham stood up and thanked God for his wife. My wife Ruth was the most incredible woman I have ever known. Whenever I was asked to name the finest Christian I had ever met, I always replied, my wife Ruth. She was a spiritual giant whose unparalleled knowledge of the Bible and commitment to prayer were a challenge and inspiration to everyone who knew her. As you read books about her and Billy Graham, you quickly see that she was committed to the building up of her husband as a man of God. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no foul language come from your mouth, but only what's good for building up someone in need, so that it gives grace to those who hear. So how about you? What are you committed to? Some thoughts for the week. Pray that the Holy Spirit might make you aware of the words that easily flow from your mouth that might tear down rather than build up your husband. Think about when the last time was that you told your man that you admired his talent or that you loved his smile. Find some genuine ways to praise him this week and memorize Ephesians 4.29. 